So my name is Dr. Rashmi Halker Singh. I'm the deputy editor of the Headache Journal, and I'm joined today by three of the authors of the of this year's um, Headache Journal Member's Choice Award for the paper alterations in brain function after cognitive behavioral therapy for migraine in children and adolescents. Doctors Hadas Navin uh, Averbuck, Dr. Robert Coghill, and Dr. Scott Powers. Before we begin today's interview, congratulations from the entire editorial board at Headache on this award. This is tremendous work that's helped add to insights to treatment options for migraine, cognitive behavioral therapy, especially for a population that needs additional options. And we're honored that you chose to publish this piece with us and that we we're able to share your, your research. So congratulations. Um, you know, before we get into the details of this paper, you pointed out that migraine affects over 6 million children and adolescents. Can you speak for a moment on the impact that this has on their ability to participate in school and other activities? What impact does migraine have on quality of life when we think about children and adolescents? Yeah, first off, just thank you so much for having us all today. We look forward to talking about the work that we're doing and what it's led to. Uh, it is true that over 10% of youth in the United States experience migraine, which if you do the numbers, figures out to over 6 million kids. And when you're in school every day for more months of the year than you are having summer break, the impact can be tremendous on you at school. And unlike other chronic illnesses where maybe your illness might have you out of school for lengthy periods of time, for example, a child undergoing cancer treatment, uh, in headache, you might miss days intermittently. So you're sort of expected to catch up on your homework on your own. Uh, you might need to go to the nurse's office when your headache starts to get your acute treatment. And maybe that takes you 20 or 30 minutes and you've already transitioned to another class. So a lot of the workload at school can be disrupted by intermittent absences and needing to sort of catch up on your own without having a formal process at the school to help you with your homework unlike what you might see in other chronic illnesses where you might be gone for weeks at a time for some of your treatment. And then in addition to that, a lot of times headaches in youth can begin in the afternoon and last into the evening due to maybe not following all your healthy habits at school or not having a water bottle with you or stress related to classes and tests. So your homework period after school or your leisure time after school can be affected. So it's not only at school, but hours after school that are impacted. And our pediatric MIDAS, our migraine disability assessment scale, clearly shows that. And when you ask about overall quality of life, we used a quality of life instrument in some earlier studies. And we found that quality of life for youth with migraine is impacted similarly to other chronic illnesses like cardiac disease, rheumatological diseases, and cancer itself. So there is a tremendous impact on the vast majority of youth with migraine in their everyday activities, including school. I'd like to add one thing as sort of a, a more of a, a general pain person than a headache person per se. I'm just astonished at, you know, the amount of suffering that these kids have. I mean, when many of the kids in our studies had uh, 15, 15 migraine days per month, you know, that's a tremendous impact. Um, and the intensity of the pain that they experience is just, you know, significant degree of suffering as well. And that that struck me as sort of a newcomer. This is this was actually my first study, I think, with migraine. So uh, really, really struck me as these kids are experiencing a tremendous amount of suffering as well. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. You know, I'm actually the parent of an adolescent who has migraine. I have a ninth grade daughter and she has migraine and she has intermittent attacks and you just never know when one's going to happen. Um, they take her out of school occasionally. Sometimes she misses work, sometimes she misses social events. Um, there was a time in middle school when she had to miss basketball games. She, was, she played basketball and she called, she would call us up um, from practice ex just explaining that, you know, she's like, mom, you know, when the, the basketball pounds the floor, that's what my head feels like. And it was, you know, it really took her out of all of the activities that she would enjoy as well as missing school. And it, it's just like Dr. Powers mentioned, um, you know, you don't miss a consistent amount of time, but these attacks can have a dramatic influence just missing bits and pieces here and there. So I, I you know, I just wanna echo everything that you all are saying. 
So with that background in mind, can you please walk our viewers through this study and you know, what were the objectives? What, what did you hope to accomplish? And how did you set out to, to, uh, to accomplish all of them? Well, we've been doing a lot of different research on clinical trials with adolescent and childhood populations. And we've studied things from medications to cognitive behavioral therapies. Um, this study was really the idea of, we know that cognitive behavioral therapy is effective, but we're not sure exactly what the mechanisms are and why it improves lives. So this was a pilot study that we only studied cognitive behavioral therapy. The children were not taking any prevention medication. And we looked at a baseline month of how their headaches were before treatment. And during that month, they underwent brain imaging and pain sensory testing. And then they started eight weeks of evidence-based treatment. And at the end of that eight weeks, we looked at headache days by diary. We looked at disability outcomes. And we looked at pre-post differences in a relatively small group of adolescents, around 20. And then we did brain imaging and pain sensory testing again at the end of eight weeks. Uh, we know from some of our studies that it, it can be improvement pretty quickly with cognitive behavioral therapy. That's why we chose two months, but oftentimes they can continue to improve over time. But we really wanted to get a sense of variability. Some kids getting a lot better, some kids maybe on their way to getting better, maybe some kids not getting better yet. So that Dr. Coghill and his team would have the ability to see some variance in clinical outcomes and then see if that correlated with what they found as neuroscientists. So that was sort of the overall design of the study. And I can let Hadass and Bob talk about what they found from a neuroscientific perspective. So I think one of the most interesting findings for us was that uh, there was a correlation uh, between the amount of um, headache reduction, number of headache days um, that was reduced after CBT and changes, uh, neural changes, specifically in functional connectivity. And we focused on an area called the amygdala. So that's um, a key area in pain. And also it was shown to be involved in uh, pathophysiology for um, migraine and be involved with CBT. So this is why we focused on this area. So the connectivity between this area and areas of the prefrontal cortex, such as the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, um, was reduced, specifically the right amygdala and the area of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Um, greater uh, reduction in headache days was correlated with greater um, reduction in the functional connectivity between these two areas. Um, so I think that was one of the most interesting findings um, in my point of view, because the, the right amygdala specifically is uh, pronosusceptive. So after CBT, we see this maybe a breaking connection. So now this area that is pronosusceptive has less influence on the um, you know, frontal areas which are involved in cognitive function. So I think that was a really interesting finding. And I, and I would add too, I think, one of the things that's really important about these studies is they're showing, you know, a cognitive technique that is resulting in changes in the brain. And I think that really makes phenomena like cognitive behavior, or treatments like cognitive behavioral therapy or meditation that much more real and that much more acceptable. Like they really actually do something to your brain and it's not all just, you know, smoke and mirrors and mumbo jumbo. So, and I think that's uh, one of our hopes with that is it does make it much more acceptable to patients. It makes it more acceptable to providers and hopefully it'll make it a lot more acceptable to payers as well. Because it's certainly, as Scott had mentioned, it's a, you know, it's a very, very effective evidence-based treatment. And um, based on some of the other work that, that uh, Scott Powers and Andrew Hershey have done when the two most commonly used preventatives for migraine, uh, amitriptyline, and placebo, amitriptyline and topiramate are no better than placebo. We really need strong evidence for treatments for these kids. And I think this is really adding to that body of evidence. Yeah, I think these results are really exciting for the, the reasons that you outlined, the fact that we actually see changes happening in brain function, brain connectivity, based on a non-pharmacologic approach to migraine is fascinating. 
especially because when we talk about medication, so much of our discussion in clinic revolves around possible side effects and ad potential adverse events. And when we're talking about adolescence, you know, that those discussions become so much more important, you, you know, with tapiramate, the potential cognitive side effects, with amitriptyline, the potential sedation effects, you know, we worry about that and the potential implications that it has on children and adolescents and their functioning. And there is less of that with things like CBT. And if we can um, demonstrate that there is um, true changes happening in the brain, true positive uh, changes happening, I, I, I'm just so excited about that. Um, I really do hope that this will lead to um, you know, better coverage and um, will make it easier for clinicians and parents and, and you know, providers to, uh, to prescribe this more often. What do you see as the next steps? Like, where, where do we go from here? Because this is, this is, I think, truly groundbreaking research. It's one of the most exciting things as a team that we've been discussing since we did this. And I mentioned, is it a pilot study? Because what we really want to understand is mechanism of treatment for different types of treatment. And we also want to understand, as Dr. Coghill mentioned, what is it about this placebo effect that's creating pretty clinically meaningful outcomes in adolescent and childhood populations. So we have two grants funded by the National Institutes of Health that are ongoing now that are randomizing youth into different conditions. So one is CBT, just like in our pilot study, uh, but we're also doing amitriptyline, which is the most commonly prescribed medication worldwide for uh, headache and migraine, as well as placebo in a double-blinded fashion. So we're replicating some things from the CHAMP trial to see what kind of distinct differences we might see between non-pharmacologic treatments and placebo pill. And then we also, because there are mind and body skills in cognitive behavioral therapy, we've got a group that's receiving the relaxation components of cognitive behavioral therapy alone. And then we have a group that's receiving the cognitive reappraisal, management of mood and thinking components alone to see if they truly are synergistic at a uh, brain level. So those studies are ongoing, recruiting well, and kids are doing great being the scanner. They're doing great tolerating pain sensory testing. They're, as they've always done, doing great filling out their headache diaries. We've got about 71 enrolled at this point, looking to have close to 200. And we should have answers sometime in the next three to four years about those. I'll, I can certainly let Bob and Hadas talk more about the technicalities, but. I get excited talking about what we're gonna learn and how that may influence precision medicine and understanding of why kids get better in addition to the fact that we can get them better. Yeah, I think one of the, the unique aspects of, of both the, the well, of the, uh, the new studies is we're actually gonna have kids practice their intervention while they're in the scanner. So we scan them at baseline before they've had any, any training or any pills or anything. Uh, then we put then eight weeks later, we put them in the scanner and scan them before they practice their intervention and then scan them while they're practicing their intervention. The pill taking groups take pills in the middle of the scan. Um, the the uh, cognitive groups take uh, engage in their cognitive process during the scan. We're also using arterial spin label imaging in addition to bold. And that gives us a nice snapshot of cerebral blood flow, which is sort of the correlate of neural activity, the bold signal is sort of a correlate of cerebral blood flow. It's best for measuring very transient changes, whereas arterial spin label uh, imaging is much better for measuring more sustained changes. So we've got those two techniques going in both sort of a resting state before and after treatment, as well as during active performance of the treatment. So I think we can really start to tease apart the mechanisms and how things are gonna be working. Another component of those studies is we're looking at quantitative sensory testing as we did in our pilot study. So we'll see if the pain processing from the body to the brain and back is impacted. And if baseline um, ability to process pain, is it, is it uh, something that's consistent or is it a little bit dysregulated? And if it is, we found in pilot studies that cognitive behavioral therapy might help you even more if we have a biomarker of pain processing at baseline that your pain processing is already a little dysregulated. So we may find some ways to identify participants that will become patients in the future that would be the people that we can predict might do better with a different therapy in addition to understanding 
differences, similarities, and maybe synergistic effects of these different types of treatments. And it sets a paradigm for studying new therapeutics down the road. So some of the new therapeutics in the field that might be uh, antibody-based or device-based or even more up-to-date behavioral therapies like acceptance and commitment therapy and mindfulness-based stress reduction therapy that are being used in children, adolescents, and adults with migraine. This is a paradigm that might allow us to look at mechanism and compare across interventions over the next decade, which will really drill down to a better understanding of why kids get better and how they get better. Well, I think that sounds really exciting. There's so much to, to be learned. And I think this will really shed a lot of light on migraine and pain mechanisms and hopefully shed the way for a lot more, um, you know, treatment options for children, adolescents, and also adults, because I think we can take a lot of this into um, the way we treat adults with migraine as well, because there is overlap there too. Um, any final comments that you want to share with our viewers before we conclude? Yeah, I've got one. I think one of the things that's really, really, that's been really interesting and fun about this, this whole process and the series of studies that we've been doing is it's really an outstanding example of team science where um, we've teamed up with Scott with his deep expertise in migraine and psychological treatment. We bring our functional neuroimaging and quantitative expert you know, quantitative sensory testing expertise and you know and uh, you know basically our neuroscience to this picture. And the two of us, you know, the two groups converging together has just been really phenomenal. I mean, the amount, I think it really lets us get a depth of understanding in each of those areas that neither one of us alone could have accomplished. So I think that's a, it's a huge example of how powerful team science really is. And I would say the one thing that's been remarkable during my entire career is just how much youth that we see for clinical care are willing to participate and learn more so that both their care might be improved, but more importantly to many of the kids, it's like, if I can help somebody else, then I'm very happy to participate. So adolescence can be a time where you're going through lots of changes, but one of the things I've seen consistently true for our youth that we take care of is how willing they are to participate in research so that we can all get smarter and help out more people. And that, that in some ways, whether or not you're the clinician uh, in the clinic taking care of them, or you're the neuroscientist in the MRI lab that's studying brain function, all of us get to interact with these youth and their families when they participate in studies. We get to know them, we get to learn about them, and they're really doing a true service to all of us in the headache field, because if we learn how to get them better, then maybe our adult colleagues won't have as many people that haven't done as well for so long that they're trying to take care of, and that's really the vision of, a, of our headache center is that we can change the trajectory of lives by doing science and excellent care, and very importantly, team science, team care, team education, and part of that team starts very much with the young person in front of us. I would just echo what um, Bob and Scott said. I think there, we need, as a researcher, I think we need clinicians to make sure that we are working on the right questions even and helping, you know, uh, progress the field. And I think clinicians can get answers um, from us. So I think the collaboration between, you know, people from different fields, that is the key, um, you know, for the future. Um, so that is what I'm taking from this one. Well, congratulations again on your award. And thank you so much for your outstanding work. We look forward to seeing more come from your lab in the future. Thank you so much, Rashmi. Yeah, thanks very much. And again, we're really, really honored to receive this award too. It's really great. Bye.